I'm Daniel Wordsworth. I've led humanitarian relief efforts in just about every disaster, natural and man-made, for the last 30 years. Smuggled into North Afghanistan in a helicopter after 9-11, made the overland route to Kyiv in the early days of the Ukraine invasion, and I led an emergency team into Sri Lanka after the East Asia tsunami. Across all continents, I've seen the worst of humanity. Terrible tragedy in places like Darfur, Congo, and Somalia. Horrors even worse than you can imagine. I've been in wars, famines, and epidemics. But here's the thing. Having experienced and seen all of this, I believe the world is abundant. As humans, we can make a difference. And I know, not believe, I know that humans are good. The way you see the world is how the world will show up for you. And in this podcast, I'll explain why. We'll talk to leaders, people making a difference, and we'll discuss the issues that impact us as they happen. Well, here we are, first episode, first yeah. podcast. Uh, Daniel, I should introduce myself. You know who I am, but the listener does not. My name's Mike Fitzpatrick, and I'm here not because I've done any of the things that you've just mentioned. You've done, in fact, far from it. I'm here to help facilitate the mm -hmm. stories and the conversation, yep. ask the questions that we like to think the listeners or the listener will be mm -hmm. asking of you whilst they're listening to this podcast. So I guess the first question, we've, we've heard from you briefly about what you've done. Mm-hmm. You seem to have led an incredible life. But really, in order to understand what you've got to say, I think we need to understand why you're saying it. Mm -hmm. Who are you and why are we going to listen to you? I think there are two reasons. There's a reason related to me and then there's something more broadly about what's happening in the world right now. I think for me, I bring a unique perspective. So I'm going to be talking about things like abundance and people being good and a whole range of sort of optimistic things. And I think often when people hear that, uh, they hear it, there's a, actually a famous book written out of Silicon Valley about abundance. Mm -hmm. You know, that guy's a billionaire. You know, he lives in Silicon Valley. So you expect him to be talking about abundance, right? A life is abundant for him and it's evidently abundant. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about places like um, war-torn Somalia, about um, communities affected by, um, you, you know, truly dreadful poverty in Congo, refugee camps around the world. And I'm going to be then in that space trying to convince the listener that in that place actually you can find abundance. It, and so I think the unique perspective that I'm going to bring is that I'm going to try to shine a light on how amazing and truly remarkable the world is from the very places that we think are the most scarce. And I'm going to be talking about human goodness in the places that people think are the, are the clearest evidence of human wickedness. And so I think that perspective will be surprising for people. I think it's the last thing that people will be expecting from someone that's lived the kind of life that I've lived. But I also think that I'm, we're trying to speak into a certain moment. Mm -hmm. So I think there are key questions that we're being asked as societies, as cultures, about how the future will unfold. And I think how we answer these questions will actually determine how the 21st century will um, unfold for us. Do we think there's enough in the world? Do we think people are good? Do we think that an average everyday person can actually make a difference? How we answer those questions, I think, will determine the next hundred years. And so I want to have a conversation with people about this and try to convince them that the world actually is abundant. People are surprisingly good. And that when we come together, what we can do is truly remarkable. So we'll get to all of that, hopefully, very quickly. But you were talking a second ago about the worst of human wickedness. Mm -hmm. And for us to understand some or try and understand some of what you've seen, mm -hmm. what would be the worst you've seen? So I, I always get a little bit funny about talking about this because um, there are some things that that demand a response, right? You know, it's a, bit, a little bit like if you were walking down the street and you saw something happening yes, and it was bad, your soul is asked a question, right? Are you going to do something about this? Are you going to jump into action and actually help here or are you not going to? And if you decide you're not going to, 
And you keep deciding that kind of thing. Something happens to a person. Yeah. So I, I have to be careful about uh, the degree to which I talk about some things in the world because if you don't, if you hear those things and you don't do anything about those things, it has an impact on a person. I know this may sound funny, but it's just true. Yeah. So there are some things that I don't talk about. Yeah. So talk to talk about one that you. So I'll talk about something that I will about. talk about. Yeah. yeah. I sat in a room once in the early 2000s during the RUF period in Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone was in a civil war. It was a particularly brutal civil war. It's um, and it was characterized by two things. The civil war was largely fought by child soldiers. So it was children fighting against children and children going into villages and burning those villages down. And the nature of the conflict was that the other uh, rebel forces would use children to go back to their own villages and their own communities and kill their own neighbors as a part of a way of hardening them for the conflict. So it was incredibly brutal. But what was, I think even more infamous about that battle and those fights was that they would cut the hands off children. So when the child soldiers would go into a village, they would, with a machete, cut off one or two hands of small children. So I, no one had really seen that before. Um, we're talking about literally tens of thousands of children with their hands cut off from the age of two or three. Tens of thousands. Yeah. And uh, so I sat in a room once in Sierra Leone, which was a group of children that had their hands cut off. You know, you're looking at a six-year-old with no hands, eight-year-old, nine-year-olds, no hands, little girls, little boys. But also what was remarkable about that room was there were teenage kids in that room who also had no hands. And they were teaching the younger ones how to live life with no hands, right? So how do you put a dress on if you don't have any hands? How do you eat without hands? There's so many daily things that we do <laughs> And how do you do that when you don't have hands? And what was remarkable was you had 14, 15, 16-year-olds teaching six, seven, eight-year-olds how to live life with no hands. So at one moment, it's, it's a bad thing. Yeah. But also, think about these 14, 15, 16, how awesome are they? Yeah. This is, I think, very symbolic of what I'm going to be talking about, that actually in a place where the worst is, Often, what you find is some of the most, um, some of the greatest examples of goodness. And do you feel that goodness shows up in those places because of the level of wickedness, or is there good everywhere? I mean, you honestly can't look at the world and what's happening in the world and happening in countries everywhere, continents everywhere, and say there are everyone is good. Can you? I can't say everyone is good, but I can say overwhelmingly. To a truly overwhelming degree, there are more good people and more goodness is done than ever badness is done and wicked people are present. If you had have asked me at the beginning of all of this if I thought this was true, I would say, no, the world looks appalling. Look at the dreadful things that happen around us. It seems overwhelming. But it just turns out it's just not the case, right? It turns out when you get into these places, people largely can't help themselves but be good. I can't really explain why it is. It just is. Yep. That for every one bad thing, for every one truly dreadful thing, in every single instance, now this is whether you're talking about famines, Ebola outbreaks, whether you're talking about the, the East Timor, or the city of Dili being literally burned to the ground. Yep. Or as I've said, uh, children with, with their hands cut off. Then meeting those child soldiers that in the face of all of that, the goodness that comes in response is always overwhelming. Yep. I have never, I've been to some of the most dangerous places on earth during dreadful things, in wars, after wars, in the middle of disasters. And I can say that I have never in a single instance been um, by myself. And in fact, I've never ever been the first person there. Yep. Now at one level, the families are already there caring for their kids, trying to make a life. So they're already there, mm -hmm. yeah. Behaving in a forgiving, open, optimistic way that would shock you, actually, if you saw it. But also carers are always there. I had to get smuggled into Afghanistan once. It was so hard to get there. And yet when I arrived at the refugee camp to help, there were two other aid workers already standing there, right? It's like <laughs> it's happened to me so consistently 
that I'm just convinced now. So when you started doing the work you do, and, and do, you, do you describe yourself as a humanitarian? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to make sure. I didn't want to call you a humanitarian yeah. and then have you say, don't call me a humanitarian. Yeah, no, I think I'm But when you started humanitarian work, how long did it take for you to be that optimistic about people? Was it immediate or did it take 20 years? Uh, it happened immediately and then it took 20 years. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was, I think the first experience that I had, I learned this, but then I forgot all about this and then it took me 20 years to relearn it. Yeah, that's what happened. In my late teens and early 20s, I decided I wanted to help poor people. And I was living in Sydney in the 80s in that time. And I was just grew up on a farm and I'd been in the Navy. I didn't really know. I didn't even really know what poor people were. I didn't really, I had no clue how you do any of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I decided I wanted to help people. One thing that seemed that I could do was there were kids on the street and there were people coming out of prison and there were drug addicts and different things that needed a place to stay. And so I thought, well, I'm going to create a house in Sydney and I'm going to get two or three other guys like me, got folk, you know, regular guys that had jobs, yeah. and we're going to rent this big house. And in the rooms we're going to put bunk beds. So there'd be four bedrooms, there'd be like four normals, right, not street kids, guys just like me, right. And that we would have these four rooms and we would put four bunk beds in those rooms. So that gave us about 16 beds. And, uh, and then what we would do is we would send out letters to every youth crisis centre, every hostel, every prison, any place that took in sort of people that um, looked after people. You know, like a halfway the street. house. Yeah, like halfway houses, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So we sent letters because this is pre-email and everything. We just sent letters and we said, we've opened this house. It's in Pimble. We take in anyone that you have. If there's someone that's too wild for you, someone that you want to throw out or someone that you can't take in, send them to us. We take everybody. And so this was in the late 80s. And we had an avalanche of people coming in, right? So we had people off the street, people out of prison, a whole bunch of people started coming to this house. And the deal was if you were one of the four normals, you had to, like, do a normal job and then you had to put all the money into, the like, a kitty and you had to pay the rent, you had to pay for everybody's food and you had to be willing to let everything get stolen because everybody stole everything from us. Within the first week or so, everything you own was gone. Now, this is another story we'll tell another time, but we all had a prized possession that we hid. Yep. And it took some months for people to find those things, but they found those prized possessions. Yep. Everything got stolen. But in order to be in this house, it was a lot. Yep. It was a lot. You had to work, all your money was gone. You lived in the same room as people just coming out of prison and things like this. And we're like 19, 20 year old kids. And it was a madhouse. What happened over about two years of doing this is we had not an avalanche of people in need. Actually, what we had was an avalanche of people that wanted to do it with us. So it was like we had an avalanche of these normals. We had all these other young people coming saying, well, I, I want to be in the house as well. I want to, like, work, give up all my money and look after people off the street. And so we got a second house. And then there was a whole bunch of young uh, women that wanted to do it, so we got a third house. Then there were some married couples that wanted to do this, so we got a fourth house. And we started taking in all of these people, and we had so many people lined up to come in and be in these houses that we then rented a farm. And then we started searching around the world for people that did the kind of work that we did. So we went to India, Colombia, Ukraine, Indonesia, Philippines. We went to jungles and slums in India, and we tried to find people like us that were serving poor people And so we couldn't just keep opening houses in Sydney, so we just created this farm. We took in 10, 20 people at a time, and then we would send them around the world to go and help poor people around the world. And and what struck me at that time, and it took me 20 more years to remember it, was that what we were overwhelmed by was not need. We were overwhelmed by people who wanted to help with that need. It It was a shocking to actually experience it. But I think because you're in your 20s, you just take that stuff for granted. Yeah. I mean, you see it, but you kind of just take it for granted. And then I got into this kind of work, working for NGOs, going around the world, doing this kind of stuff. And then I came to realize 20 more years later, that's basically what people are like. They want to help. And does that concept still exist, the one you created? Does it still active around the world or did it? No, it, uh, you know, I ended up I ended up in a slum and then I decided that, no, I needed... What we discovered in the end was we were as poor as the poor people. Mm. 
because we kept giving our money away and everything we owned got stolen. And we were as poor as the poor people. And then at one point I was in this, this slum area called Chungking Mansions in Hong Kong and I realised that I was in as much trouble as they were. <laughs> <laughs> they would say, we need help. And I would go, here I am. And they would go, we don't want you. We want a job. We want money. We want something. Help, help, help. And then I thought, okay, then I wonder if there are any groups that, like, have money and resources. And so I know it sounds so naive, but this is pre-internet. This is these were just a group of us just trying our best. Yeah, the only way you could find information was go to a library and yeah, go get a world yeah, book. Exactly, go to a library <laughs> read a newspaper. Yeah. And then we thought, are there... Are there, like, organisations that have resources that can really help people who are poor? And I literally, I was reading, I think it was a Time magazine, and I read about this, this thing called an NGO. And this NGO had all this money, and they used to go around the world and help poor people all over the world, and I thought, this is amazing. And so I came back to Australia and I thought, I'm going to go and work for one of these groups because they have apparently money and they can stop poor people being poor. Yeah, and that started me on this journey that's got me where I am now. The story of putting four bunk beds into a room in Sydney is not too far from where I think the rental crisis in Sydney has, <laughs> is has got help. people now. They've got four people to a room based on the cost of living, which which kind of brings us to abundance. And you mentioned it earlier on. We look at, I guess, certainly in the West, that when things are taken from us, that they are a right and that we don't have enough. For example, at the moment with the cost of living pressure all over the world and inflation crazy. People are saying they don't have enough. They don't have enough money, yet they're still out buying televisions. So the Reserve Bank continues to put mortgage and interest rates up. Mm. During the pandemic and the lockdowns, people started hoarding. There was no toilet paper. There's not enough. That's a mainstream idea of yeah. scarcity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not what you're talking about when you talk about scarcity and abundance, is it? Actually, it is and it isn't. Right, so I'll talk about what I'm more clearly talking about, but then I'm going to back my way into that because actually, what you're describing is what it really is. Yeah, that's that's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I when a person like me, right? So if you're a, if you're in my life, yep. So you're going to a um, place that's affected by war. Hmm. You're going to a refugee camp. Or you're going to a city like Mogadishu, or you're going into a jungle in Congo or somewhere. Uh, when you talk about scarcity in that environment, it's a, it's a very brutal, cold form of scarcity. You know, when a refugee is fleeing a conflict, typically it takes them about two weeks to get to safety. So you imagine you're a mum or a dad and you have two or three kids. You're on a two-week journey and, and most of that's walking. So you're carrying your child with you. And often along the way you have to make decisions because there may be three children and there's two adults and you have to carry them and so you have to leave one behind. Yeah? When you make those decisions and then finally you arrive at a refugee camp and in a refugee camp we create what's called reception centres. So they're like places in the refugee camp that when somebody's made this journey you receive them. Yeah? And you, you get their name, you take it down and you assign them a place to go and live you give them a first sort of aid package or something like that. They're called reception centres. So when you stand in a reception centre like that and you see refugees streaming in, you're seeing people that have walked two weeks and along that way maybe lost a child because of a decision they've made and they're staggering into this place with nothing and they're desperate. That's scarcity. Yep. That's That's... Uh, a very profound mm. type of scarcity. If you live in a country that's had nothing but conflict for 20 years, if you s live in the city of Aleppo and 40% of your city has been destroyed by bombing and you have an earthquake and then more of it's been destroyed, you start, you start despairing that there's anything for you but um, death and destruction awaiting you. That's a type of scarcity. Yep. That's real. That exists in many places. But what I'm getting at is there's another kind of scarcity beyond that. And that is the belief that so many of us have is that the world is fundamentally scarce, that there's somehow a battle for resources going on, that there just is not enough. Yep. And when we get trapped in that way of thinking, 
that there's not enough, that everything is going to run out. We start thinking that if we don't grab boxes and boxes of toilet paper, there'll be none left for us. But what was our experience? They all just come, there's this toilet yeah. paper there in the next week. Yeah, there's more. There's more. That, but we live with fear. I don't know about you, but I live with economic anxiety. Yep. Hey, everybody lives with economic anxiety because Even we're so reliant upon... A job. The, yeah, a job <laughs> to pay rent, to yeah. pay a mortgage, to buy food. Yeah. But when you've had to hunt and forage for it, though, that's that's a different kind of scarcity. It is a different kind of scarcity, but, but I would say that in a human being and for many of the people that are listening to this, the kind of scarcity that's... I think they look over and they look at a place like Somalia and they might think there's scarcity. But what I've discovered is when you go to those places, actually you find abundance. Yep. And yet in Melbourne when I talk to many people and they talk to me, they talk to me out of a place of scarcity, fear that there's not enough, fear that they're going to lose everything, fear that they're not going to make it to the end of their life and have a sort of positive existence or a life of meaning of some kind. And even though we actually live in what many people would call abundance, we show up every day as if it's all about to go yeah, or that it's not going to last. And because of that we become grasping and because of that, we frame our life with this notion of loss rather than embracing abundance that's around us and openly being willing to share it with others. It changes the entire way that we show up in the world. That does seem overly optimistic. Mm. What I take from that is you're saying the majority of people in the world, certainly the Western world, are glass half empty. empty. Yeah. But if you look at the world as abundant, it will show up for you abundant. That takes a lot of optimism where do we get that optimism from? How do you make yourself an optimistic person? Yeah. I think of myself as a reluctant optimist, meaning I didn't start off this way. I've just now seen so much. Of, it's so clear and so evident to me that I can't be anything except optimistic. Yeah. Because the world is just this way. And I don't, I am the opposite of naive and glib about this. You can't tell me about a situation of scarcity worse than any one that I've been in. And here's the danger, and it's why it took me 20 years. It's like you, you go into a dive. When you start going into those places, for a long time you go into a dark dip, and after a while it starts seeing hopeless to you. So what happened to me was you start going to all of these spots and you... It, when you visit refugee camps that have been left and for, have existed for 50 years and there's a whole, there's 100,000 beautiful, wonderful people who've been dropped in some isolated border location and forgotten by the entire world with nothing for them, yep, they are like cut from the herd, yep, and just dumped, 100,000 people at a time. The world's biggest refugee camp has over 500,000 people in it. That's phenomenal. And it's just, and no one even can name it. What is its name? It's, it's <laughs> called Kuta Palong Refugee Camp in Bangladesh for the Rohingya. Here you have a whole ethnic group of people, the Rohingya, that the whole world wants to forget exists. And, and 500,000 of them are put into a bamboo refugee camp in an isolated part of Bangladesh and forgotten by all. So if after 10 years of being in those places, it's very easy to think it's hopeless. And you do get to a point where it, if you, you decide, am I going to stay or not? And if you decide you're not going to, well, then you come back, you open up a cafe or a restaurant, <laughs> right? So many people do that, by the way, in the work that I'm in. They go, I'm going to go move back to Tasmania. I'm going to have a restaurant or a bar, bar somewhere. I'm this not going to do too much for me. Too, I, there's nothing you can do. But I'm not going to do that. So then I thought, well, I'm going to have to change the way I see it. And I'm going to have to just, if no one cares, if it's these people in the middle of nowhere, then this is all they got. So what's here? Maybe there's things here that can help. And... It was like a dawning for me. I think people call that an epiphany. Is that suddenly, the moment I just chose, and it wasn't just me, it was a team of us. We just sat in a room because we were despairing. I'm speaking about an actual refugee camp of 100,000 people in Uganda in the middle of nowhere. It got started in 1958. It has 12 different nationalities in it. It has the victims, and they're not victims, but 
I hope that it comes across okay. They're like victims of every bad thing that's happened in Africa for 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. They wash up in Nakavali refugee settlement. The Somalis there, Congolese are there, uh, Burundians are there. So many different people are there. Ugandans from back in the day, 70s, are here. And we are in that camp. And what are you going to do? So many new crises are happening. People have to respond to so many things. At that time, it was the Syria crisis was happening. So everybody was divert, moving funds to help Syria. We had to still stay in that camp and do something. And so then you ask the question, well, we're going to have to rely on what's here. And so we all just decided we're going to start showing up, believing that there's more here than we think, that there's surely something under the surface here that we can use. And it went kaboom. The whole place changed for us. We started finding stuff everywhere. Yep, started literally finding things everywhere, things we could do, ways we could respond. Uh, and from that one refugee camp, we then started applying that same principle everywhere, all over the world. What was one thing you places. did? So uh, I'll, give, <laughs> I'll give one example. This was a crisis moment in, in this refugee camp. Yeah. We had thir a team of 35 people that will work there. Because it's in the middle of nowhere, you have to put your staff in the camp with the refugees. So we had 35 staff there. And we were delivering clean water every day. We were delivering nutrition for families. We had a couple of things that we were responsible for in this camp. And the, and the water was not good. And the nutrition was not enough. They kept cutting the rations because they were moving the food to Syria and other places. So the nutrition program was sort of imploding and the water system kept breaking down and it would be hours of waiting for people when they come to get it. And so what would happen to our team is our team would live in this group of set of houses and they would walk every day to get to the office and they would wear all the uniforms, like a hat like I'm wearing now, and the refugees would start shouting at them and maligning them. <laughs> like, why is the water? We had to wait three hours for the water. My child has got no food. And they would get shouted at. And so they all began wearing like jackets and hiding their logos and sneaking around, but everybody knew who they were. And so after this, months of this, they, um, they called us up and they said, we're on strike, <laughs> right? We're not doing this work anymore. We don't want to be spat at by refugees. We're here because we love refugees. Yep, they don't like us. <laughs> and so I had a, my offside, like a partner in what we were trying to do called Sarah. So Sarah goes out and she, uh, she goes to meet the 30, they're all like, you know, on strike. So she sits down with them in the office, 35 of them in this refugee camp. And, and she says, okay, what are your demands? And they're like, we have to be better. We have to give clean water. We have to have new, enough nutrition. We have to do, we can't be shouted at by these poor refugees. And then she said, what would it cost us to fix all of this? And they all, they, they said, thank you for asking. We've done the budgeting and we've got, and they passed across this sheet of paper. And it's $2 million. You know, a million and a half to fix the water system, a, a few hundred thousand to fix the clinic. The, what it was, is $2 million. And Sarah looks at the amount, looks at them, and she says, I have good news and I have bad news. <laughs> what, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, well, tell us the bad news. And she goes, we don't have $2 million. They said, we're going to end up $2 million. Where are we going to get $2 million from? This camp's one of the most forgotten places on earth. No one cares anymore about this. They all were caring about Syria. And I'm, I'm not, I don't say that cynically. Of course we should care about what was going on in Syria. It was dreadful. Yeah. I mean, how much compassion can everybody hold? This is understandable. I understand this. But she said, we don't have two million. And so then they all sat there and they said, well, they went quiet. And then they said, well, what's the good news? <laughs> <laughs> what's the good news? She says, well, I have my per diem. Which is a, a, and they go, a, a daily that's, amount. That's like that a you daily, have, yeah. you know, think she goes, when, when you go on a trip for a week, because she was going there for a week to help them. Yeah. She gets like a hundred, you know, gets up to pay for accommodation and food. So they go, this is like 35 of them in this room. They were all like uh, angry and upset. And you got to imagine, this is a very emotionally charged room. These are the people that you've put into the refugee camp yeah. to work with the refugees. Yeah, they're like, you've sent us out here and here we're getting maligned and it's not good enough and the services we're doing are not good enough. They're very angry, uh, rightly so. And uh, she's, and then she says, I have my per diem. <laughs> Sorry, I still, I still laugh about this one. And then they pause and then they're like, well, how much is your per diem? And so she reaches down and she pulls her purse out. She opens it up. 
she counts the money and she says, it's $500. And the whole room's dead quiet. And then she says, and you know what I'll do is this. We're going to break up in groups for in the next hour. I want you to come up with an idea on how to spend this $500 today to help refugees somehow in this camp. And so they all said, okay. So they all broke up, 35 of them, and an hour later they came back with, I think it was 434 ideas on what they could do today with $500 to make life better for the refugees in that camp. And they picked one. Mm -hmm. And they all trotted out with the $500 she had in cash. And I can't actually remember what the idea was, but they all trotted out and did that idea. And then they, and what happened is they all came back and everyone was so happy they felt like they'd made some momentum. And so what we decided was every single day from then on, in any situation you're in around the world, when it's really impossible and when it costs you $2 million to fix it and when we can't give you that, if you can think of something that you can do right now, today, to help a person you get $500 to do it. Now, that may sound very small, but if you've got 2,500 staff and if you're working in 15 different countries and if you're actually doing this every single day, what starts happening is this begins accumulating. Yeah. It begins building. Every day you start doing this. You start bringing about small change. And then two or three years later, you'd be amazed at the kind of things that started happening just because of that. And that just came for that moment where we just decided up until that moment we were frozen by the need for the two million. In that one moment we suddenly realized what do we actually have? And in that case it was $500. And can we do anything with this? And that idea lit off. It resulted in one country to one million children that were out of school going into school and it started with $500. Yeah, and this happened all over the place. In advertising, I think they, they call that the freedom of a tight brief. The freedom of a tight brief. You don't have to. Yeah. You've got 500. 500. What are you going to do? Go and do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that I don't think you could have come up with four, 424 ideas with 2 million. You would have done oh, yeah. two or three big ticket items. Mm -hmm. That's it. But with 500 bucks, mm -hmm. that's amazing. What I'm most amazed about there is that there's refugee camps that have been around since the 50s. We're going to need to address that in another episode. I think we should talk at length about refugee camps because yeah. I think they're endlessly both heartbreaking and fascinating, yeah. but also there's obviously good in them. Yeah. And uh, for an optimist like you, I'm sure you find good in all refugee camps, no matter how heartbreaking yeah. they are. Because they're full of refugees. When you talk about people are good and scarcity and abundance, and then you talk about $500, yeah. it does seem like, well, but how can I help? It does seem often pointless to say, well, I can't do anything, I'm one human. I can't change the world. Yeah. But you believe that people can change the world. Yeah. So I believe that what you're saying is true, but that's not the whole story. It is absolutely true. If you're sitting at home and you're thinking in the face of, when you hear me say there's a refugee camp with half a million people that's full of stateless people that nobody wants, hmm. the temptation, you could sit there and legitimately say, well, uh, what can I do about that? And the answer is nothing. But here's the good news. You are never by yourself. Isn't there, there's never a moment. Again, like I'm never, I have never, ever been by myself working on anything. I've never been, like as I said earlier, I've never even been the first one. And I've tried, by the way, to be the first one. <laughs> I have tried many times to be the first one, right? I have, tr I have spent a career trying to be the first one in the most dangerous situation where the most need occurs. And I've never even got the bronze medal. There are, you, you are always surrounded by people trying to pitch in and do something. It is a shocking realization and it is the most defining realization of my career is this fact that I'll never even get the bronze. And so on that question, if you're sitting there going, how do I possibly by myself do anything? Then I would say, you don't have to guess what? You don't have to do it by yourself. I'm here. Or I'm going to join in with you. I've spent my whole life with people that come in. I had one time, it was a beautiful, <laughs> it was a case in point. I get approached by a nun. And a nun comes sounds in. Sounds like the start of a joke. That sounds like a joke. <laughs> a nun comes to see me, gets off the elevator. 
She goes, I, I want some help. I go, okay. She has this big PowerPoint presentation for me. Now, I'd heard about it. Someone said, there's this amazing nun. You, I think you should talk to her. She's, like, remarkable. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, great, I'll talk to the nun. The PowerPoint nun. Right, so she comes in and uh, she sits there with the PowerPoint and then she says, I want to, um, you want to help the world, right? I go, yes, no, I'm like fully into that. And then she's like, well, I'm into that too. And I go, good, okay, we're coming from, you know, we're here we are. What's your what's your pitch? She goes, I have a, do you have 45 minutes? She says, I've got a 45 minute long pitch and I'm going to try to convince you of something. And I said, okay. And then first slide comes up. She says, do you realize there are 700,000 nuns around the world? I said, no, I didn't realize there were 700,000 nuns around the world. And she said, do you also realize that most of these are based and live in the poorest communities in every single country on earth? That in almost every neighborhood where poor people are, there's a Catholic nun sitting there. And I said, I had not really thought of that, but now that you say it, it makes perfect sense. And then she says, they all want to do good, but no one helps them to do it. And so then I said, it's okay, you can stop now. And then she said, I'm, I'm on slide one. <laughs> and I'm just, then I'm, I'm like, well, now let me then recap. <laughs> there are 700,000 nuns in the world. She goes, yes. I go, most of these live in neighborhoods with people around the world, yes. And those people are some of the poorest in the world, yes. And they want to help, but they don't have, they need help to help, yes. Then I said, well, we're in. We're there. But she said, it has to be harder than that. And I said, no, it's real easy. Like, I'd be a fool if I wouldn't do it. Like, I'm like a venture capital for good, right? <laughs> I'm trying to find ways to take the little things that I have, amplify it. She just gave me 700,000. She just invented Facebook, right? <laughs> I was like the guy that just saw the first Facebook pitch. I'm like, I'm on board. Since then, that, that project has gone on, unleashing those 700,000 nuns. We even did it during COVID, used nuns all around the world to do COVID messaging. That thing just took off because it turns out those 700,000 nuns are there and they did just need some help. That's the story for another podcast. But it was remarkable. Do you know that nuns, some nuns have gang signs? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, they have gang signs. But that's another uh, story. Yeah. But are they, that's an example. Are they wearing Adidas? Like, are they, like, what sort of... They don't wear any What branded. sort of gang they don't signs? Wear any that's, that is really is another story, but <laughs> they do have a gang sign. But uh, all that's to say is you're never alone. You're never alone. There's always, like, I thought I was trying to do good and I discovered one day by accident 700,000 people that were trying to do good. I've seen that over and over again all the time. It's like never ending. It's just another one. Yeah. And so I know it. So if you're sitting there feeling that you're by yourself, I'm here. You can just call me up. Yeah, I'm sitting on World Vision. We can tap into, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people across this country that are trying to help. There's an again, there's an avalanche of goodness in this world and an avalanche of good people. Almost everybody's good. Daniel, we're going to wrap it up because we could talk all day. But we have a lot more podcasts to come and a lot more, uh, lot more subjects to cover. So go ahead and uh, if you're listening on Apple, go and uh, follow or subscribe. And the same on Spotify. Uh, you can follow uh, Daniel on Instagram as well. And it's really important that you follow and subscribe on the platform so that you don't miss any of the forthcoming episodes. Daniel, talk to you next time. Good. Thank you, Fitz. <laughs>